If you have been really blessed, I wanted to please appreciate Pastor Perdue, Pastor Toyin, for the privilege of this conference. By the way, uh, when Pastor Perdue was about to bring me up, he was saying his friend and was introducing us as his friend. It's just his own way of feeling young. <laughs> We are not his friend. <laughs> not in a way of disowning him, but to just emphasize the fact that he's our, you understand what I heard? <laughs> our senior. <laughs> and if you're blessed by Pastor Leah, Pastor Hal, and the team, I want you to please appreciate them. Come on, let's wait a little better. Let's wait a little better. Praise God. I, before I allow you to see it, I have to say this. But I believe, you know Pastor Paul was speaking yesterday. I wasn't here because I had some meetings scheduled, but I watched everything online. Pastor Paul was speaking yesterday and he said, this season he has decided that I wasn't going to do anything that is not apostolic. How many people remember that? Yeah. And, you know, when I heard that, I thought to myself, what should that mean for me? Yeah, because he's one of the people I learned from. So, what should that mean for me? And I want to just ask you too, what should that mean for you? What will it mean for you to be very apostolic in your disposition this season? And you know, because you are here, and grace has been flowing here, uh, and it's apostolic, the dimension that has been happening here is completely apostolic. Uh, because Pastor Paul, you're bringing this team from Singapore to Nigeria, God is speaking to us. We can choose to ignore, but we can no longer hold God responsible. Because God already spoke to his son, he's made all the necessary you know, connections and brought this to us. Uh, Pastor Kwajusa, this morning while I was praying, uh, just preparing for this meeting, one thing that I heard clearly, God said to me, he said, your Goliaths in Nigeria will continue to roam the streets until Davids are unleashed, giving permission. Yeah. And this is not about church only. It's about countrywide. This conference is signaling us as a people that the order has changed. Yeah. And we need to receive it. We need to understand it. We need to work with it because it's beyond what is going on in the church. It is just nationwide and perhaps Africa-wide. And it's important that we take the lessons. Glory be to Jesus. Let's say a prayer together. Father, we thank you for all that you've done the last two days. And we thank you for every word that has come. We ask, Father, that you empower us, everyone in this room, everyone online, Empower us not just to be hearers, but to be doers. And in the different way that these things pertain to us, we ask, help us, Father, to be apostolic in our dispensation. Help us, Father, to be apostolic in our perspective. Help us to imbibe this thing and take it into our spaces that your kingdom may come and that your will may be established. And Lord, as I lay on the foundation that's already been laid, I ask, Lord, uh, that you breathe upon this word and let it bring transformation to every hearer in the precious name of Jesus. Somebody say it better. Amen. Amen. Please, you may have your seat. You may have your seat. Again, I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Kodju, Pastor Toy, and uh, the leadership of the Covenant Nation for the opportunity to speak at this year's Pastor's uh, and leaders conference. Um, there's a, a lot to say, but I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to just uh, allow me to say the things that pertain to this session and this opportunity. 
Pastor Lea and Pastor Howe, uh, the, the vote shared on uh, what is a very refreshing paradigm uh, or, or to renew our mind about the handshake that must happen between the old and the new generation. In fact, refresh our memory and our understanding as regarding the mind of God on the subject matter. And you know, sitting down there also listening to Pastor Perdue about the person of the leader. You know, as a man of the word and with an apostolic teaching grace, taking us into the word and bringing out what the person of the leader should be. I believe that what God, uh, you know, has put in my heart to share in this session is more about the church. The church. What kind of church and what, what things, what paradigms should we uh, uh, be focusing on to be able to really do something with all these things that we've had? I've titled this Planted, Sustained Impact Within a Local Church. Sustained Impact Within the Local Church uh, from the mindset of being planted. Being planted. You know, there's a way a place can be organized that nothing will grow there. There's a way a place can be organized that people cannot be planted there. Uh, I, I once, you know, read about, you know, something about the shark in the aquarium. Uh, that if you put a shark in an aquarium, it may not grow more than the length of that aquarium for the time that is in the aquarium. But if you take the same shark, you know, and you throw it into the ocean, into the natural habitation of the, of the shark, it starts to grow until it reaches the full length. Uh, so there are more like churches and faith communities that are like the aquarium, and there are faith communities that are like the ocean, yeah. where people can be planted, people can flourish, people can grow to the fullness of their capacity and potential. And whether you are young or old, you, 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 you just found yourself in a place where you can give expression to the gift of God on your life, and you can fulfill your destiny. And I believe that's the kind of church that can deliver a nation. That's the kind of church that can deliver the future. So, one of the important questions uh, that will be coming out in this time that I have with you is whether your church is just a restaurant or a fast food joint. <laughs> like, uh, remind me the name of some fast food. We're not advertising them, just say it. Uh -huh. You know, all kinds, KFC and the like. Or a, a real restaurant. Or whether your church is just, uh, you know, an hus a, a hospital that people just go and get their healing. You know, there are all kinds of churches, really. And, and I, I want to look at that from the point of view of how we should position our churches. Now, let me, uh, before I get back into that, let me ask this question. What is the actual purpose of the church? What is the actual purpose of the church? Can somebody just help me ask, ans answer? Let me, let's, let's do it from this point of view. So if I say to Yoda, what's Toyota all about? Please, speak out. Cars. If I say, uh, let me find something else, like Coca-Cola. What's that all about? Refresh, refreshing drinks, you know, non-alcoholic drinks and all that. Oh, have you started drinking alcohol? Okay, that's a, just to be sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what else? If I say maybe Apple, iPhone, and the like, and whatever else they choose to come up with, but we know the niche. So if I say church, Right? If I say church, what's the one word or two that should come out of your mouth? Huh? I'm hearing all kind of things. 
Somebody help me right there. Somebody say life. Somebody say, if I was asking this question in our church a few days ago, somebody say prayer. <laughs> somebody say, you know, people are saying all kinds of things. But you know the truth is that if I say church, the one word, only kivoka, that should come out easily and flowing freely is disciple. So, it's disciple. Because Matthew 28, I mean, what did Jesus tell us? Go into the world and make disciples of all nations. That's our assignment. Am I saying the truth? That is the product of the church. Is disciple. Is disciple. Let's read from Acts chapter 2 and from verse 1, sorry, Acts 2, 41 down to 47. The Bible says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone has need. Look at verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church Daily, those who are being saved. The Lord had it to the church daily, those who are being saved. This is a picture of the early church here in Acts chapter 2. How did they, you know, conceptualize the church? How did they behave themselves? What kind of environment was being created? It's, this shows that the environment that they created was the kind of environment that lends itself to God's original intention. Are you still following me? So the major instruction Jesus gave to his disciples before he ascended up was make disciples of all nations. There's an environment that can be created that can lend itself to making disciples. There's another environment that can be created that may not lend itself to making disciples. But the early church was configured in such a way that the real intention of God could thrive in the atmosphere that has been created. So, uh, discipleship is one of the most important products of the local church, and it's the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is how the family of God is populated, nourished, and strengthened. And if we are going to do Everything that we've been taught in this conference, if, if there's going to be a renewer, that renewer will have to follow the pathway of making discipleship uh, from a different perspective, if I can put it that way. So, so I mean, you know, disciple making starts is so winning. Like we all know, you know, uh, yesterday I was looking at my notes as Pastor Howe was preaching and was talking about, uh, uh, you know, believing, becoming, belonging. And I quickly open my note. It's there. I hope this man will not finish my message. You know, because that's the danger of not being the first speaker. You may have to rework and rework and rework your note. You know, because while I was thinking about the process of disciple making, uh, one process that we have gotten accustomed to, which was what, you know, Pastor Howard was talking about from a different perspective yesterday, was the three fundamental elements of discipleship uh, for the local church. Believing, becoming, and belonging. You know, and Pastor Howe helped us yesterday to say, look, if you want to reach the younger generation, you have to flip this thing. You have to start from belonging. But can I tell you this? We can start from belonging. We can start from, you know, the point is you have to do all. Pastor, I was saying that for us to reach the younger generation, we start from belonging. 
but belonging also will then be, become believing and then to now become, I mean, do now be becoming eventually, which is the whole thing. So, anyhow, we're starting it. We need to focus on raising disciples. To reach the younger generation, belonging works as a first step, like we were taught yesterday. Uh, if you are reaching maybe some of the older generation, <laughs> uh, you may have to start with believing. <laughs> because I said they see signs, they will not believe. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Some of them are so frustrated, they have problems. Young people have minimal problems. Are you following me? Yeah, their problems are not many. <laughs> so they, 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 they belong easily. But the older people, they, they, because some of them, I mean, the problem is what they want solved. And they need signs to be able to believe. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. So believing, becoming, belonging is a pathway. Anyhow, we are arranging is a pathway to raising disciples. But we are now facing a generation where all these things are not, as in, we're not paying attention to some of these things again. The reason why some of our churches are not attracting young people is because belonging is no longer important to us. And sometimes we want to treat everybody the same. So if you don't believe first, we don't want you here. So, believing is identifying with Jesus through salvation. Becoming to be like Jesus and represent him. First, I mean, John chapter 1 and verse 12. He came to his own, his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become, you know, uh, the, the, the sons of God. The right, the power to become the sons of God, uh, even those who believe in his name. So, believing, becoming, everything is in that process. That was why Jesus came, you know, becoming to be like Jesus and represent him well. Now, in our journey of, you know, believing, belonging, and creating that atmosphere, I mean, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In belonging, for instance, people only want to belong in a place where they feel wanted and where they feel needed. Yeah. Wanted and needed. If I come into a church and nobody, like we say in this part of the world, is giving me face, nobody, you know, really show that they care about me, I don't feel wanted. If I come into a church and for six months or so, that if I survive six months, nobody has asked me to do anything then I don't feel needed. To be wanted is a factor of warmth. To be needed is a factor of invitation to serve. Are you still with me today? But those two are the things that lend themselves to the issue of belonging. Ah. Uh. You know, a lot of the time, we, we stop at believing. Just getting people to believe. We preach the gospel of salvation, and we stop there. Yeah. And we feel like every other thing will solve, I mean, solve itself, sort itself out. Yeah. At least people have, you know, they now believe, and that's what is most important. In fact, it affects how we measure success. Right. Because if you have a big program, and uh, 200 people give their life to Christ, we can celebrate and over-celebrate it to the detriment of real discipleship. Amen. Because we're now stopping at those who believe. What about becoming and what about belonging? Are you still with me today? Very, very important. So, how do we move people from come and see to come and die? Because this is the big deal about discipleship. This is the big deal about discipleship. Moving people from come and see to come and die. You see, in the days of Christ, the miracles moved them into come and see. You know, a brother we call it, Nathaniel was called, come and see, you know, uh, the woman uh, at the well. 
uh, in the book of John, he said, come and see the man that told me everything that I've done. It's about come and see. That's what the signs do. They bring people in. And you, you know that in Nigeria right now and around Africa, we are in a revival of power. In a revival of, you know, of prayer and worship that is then resulting into manifestations of power and the prophetic. Like the woman said, come and see a man that told me everything. Because Jesus just analyzed our life to her. Just in quick succession. You have been married, you know, to five men. The one you are living with now is not the woman. Eh! And you know how far we have taken this thing now. You know, Jesus did not tell her her name, but if it was today, your name is Janet. Your mother's name is uh, a Janetia. <laughs> you know, and all that. And then we we'll release the phone number of his, our father. <laughs> you know, and, you know, fear will grip our heart. And, but all that moved people into believing. Uh, put a slide back. All that moved people into believing. If we stop there, we haven't gotten the job done. Because when you say church, church is about disciple. Amen. It's not about believers. Amen. The believing is the starting point yeah. in the journey of raising disciples. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying is that the, the, the things that we're seeing and the revival that we're seeing, uh, we need to maximize them and the instrument that will maximize them uh, uh, it's you and I, the custodians of the local church. Yeah. It is the church. It is the church that will maximize the revival so that we don't stop at believing. We move from believing to, you know, becoming, to belonging. And when signs bring them, when events bring them, sometimes we start them out, like Pastor Al said, we belong in, but we won't stop. Because, you see, when you stop at belonging with young people, they create minimal problem. If you stop at belonging with adults, they can destroy your church. Yeah, because they have capacity to cause big problems. <laughs> I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. You know... <laughs> A child, a young person, will not impregnate anybody. <laughs> but if an adult just belongs and it stops there, okay. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> so that I won't have to say much. Put that, that slide back on the screen. Let me just show something. Now, look at this. The concentric circles. And you know, like Pastor Paul was preaching earlier, we learn from people who have gone ahead of us. This concentric circle is from Rick Warren, from Purpose Driven Church. You see, when you look at it, you see that we are supposed to be moving people, like I said, from come and see to come and die. Commi you know, from the community, we get people into the crowd of our church. And then from the crowd of our church, the, the crowd of your church are people who, who, who attend maybe once or twice a year. The last time they came was what night service. But if you ask them today, which church do you attend? They say Covenant Nation. But the last time they came was at TBS for what night service. <laughs> you know Covenant Nation, what night service was at TBS. That's the last time they came. Those are people in the crowd of the church. But the congregation are people who attend at least twice a month. Yeah, they show up monthly. But from there, we have to move people into the committed. If not for the committed, we can't have this conference. You see committed people in all kinds of uniform here. They have their day job. It is their commitment that brought them here today on a public holiday to come and serve here. Because one of the things, see, you can't come to Covenant Nation and just behave as if you are not seeing some things. Please see them. I'm begging you. See them. <laughs> the kind of things we enjoy through the ministry of this church, 
can only be pulled off through committed people. God forbid that the destiny of your church is not fulfilled because you don't have enough committed hands. Because God will put callings and responsibilities on your church. In the book of Nehemiah, I think Nehemiah chapter 4, so verse 12 or thereabouts, it says, the strength of the body bearers has decayed. So there was much rubbish. So we cannot build the wall. That's, that's the necessity of the time, was to build the wall. But he said, because the strength, can you hear me look for that scripture? He uh, uh, said, because the strength of the body bearers decayed, he said there was much rubbish and we were not able to build the wall. The moment you are not pushing people into that committed bracket consistently, you will see that there are responsibilities of the local church that will suffer. A church that God has ordained to pull off big stuff in the town where you are, in the city where you are, to impact the city. But because the strength of the burden bearers are decayed, or there are no burden bearers, because you just stop them at congregation. And they just show up. Look at that. Yeah, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 10. He said, then Judah said, the strength of the laborer is failing. And there's so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. That's what happens when we are not moving people. What am I trying to say here? Pastors, men of God, ministers, listen to me. Let's reconsider how we measure success. Because if Jesus was only going to depend on the crowd to take this gospel to the next level and the next generation, I tell you, yeah. If we look at the ministry of Jesus, it was a lot of crowd. But he always knew that this thing is not about this crowd. It's about these disciples. Yeah. Can you imagine Jesus feeding 5,000 and then on the day of Pentecost only 120? Disciples were in the upper room. All of them had free food. They saw the signs. They treated, I mean, his ministry like KFC. They just hurt and they walked away with no commitment. No commitment to his mission, no commitment to his vision, no commitment to what God has called him to do. But thank God for the 120. Thank God for the disciples. Thank God for people like Stephen in Acts chapter 7. That in the, I mean, the first matter of the church, I'm sure Jesus gave him a standing ovation because the vision of moving people from come and see to come and die was fulfilled. The first time it will be fulfilled. That somebody can actually join this movement just to see some new things, signs and all that. But the person stayed, was discipled enough to the point when they will be throwing stone at him to kill him for this thing. He did not run away. Yeah, he did not run away. He has had enough encounters to secure his heart that this is something to die for. Yeah. I presume that when heaven looks at our ministries, perhaps they're paying more attention to the people who can die for this thing than all the crowd. Because, but for such people, the gospel cannot go to the next and the next and the next. You know, in First John, uh, John the Beloved was writing, he said the things that we have seen, that we have taught, that our hands have undoed, of the word of, word of life. That's what we are committing to you. We cannot deny what we have seen. Committed people will tell you, I have experienced the power of God. This is my life. Uh, Pastor uh, um, Gary was talking yesterday at the Q&A. You heard what he said. When he had the opportunity to go abroad to go and study. He said, my life is about the church. That's a disciple. That's a disciple. My life is about the church of Jesus Christ. I'd rather stay here. And, yeah. That's, so when Jesus said, those who are forsaking this and forsaking that for my sake. Yeah. Forsaking opportunities. And I saw the way the crowd here yesterday was, when Pastor Paul, you alluded to it, the, the body language. When Pastor Gary said that, people were, uh, or something like that. Pastor Gary said, what, 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 why are you making your face like that or something like that? And it was that people were thinking that, ah, oh, that's not easy. 
How can they give you scholarship to study in America and you say, my life is about covenant nation? <laughs> That's what, no, 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 just let's get it. That's what the body language of people. But I'm saying that when we start to take this thing to the level that we're supposed to take it to, people start to see themselves in the equation of their destiny aligns with what God is doing. And in the days of his power, his people shall be willing. Are you still with me today? Very important. But we have to be intentional about creating that thing that makes people want to die for it. Very, very important. Very important. So from the committee, if you put that slide back there to the core, the core, the ministers, the leaders, the pastors, can I say this? And I want you to listen. If a church has 500 people, we celebrate God for your church. You are doing a great job. But please, can you go further to break it down for us so we can mark your script? How many people are in the core? How many people are in the committed? How many people are in the congregation? So that if something happened, something just happened like basketballs, like we say, like COVID, how many people will be sweat and how many people will remain? Because we experienced it during COVID. But around the world, we're not learning from that. Because God just decided, let, let me mark their script. <laughs> and just know, in the face of this kind of undesirable situation, unexpected situation, will my church still stand? And how many people will still be carrying the body. Because yeah. some people love their life not unto death. Or how do we put it now? That during COVID, it's to your tent, O Israel. Don't even talk to me about church. I don't want to show up for anything. And for some people, even watching online became, you know, a body. And these were people who like really used to be on fire. They believed the only problem is that it looks like they struggled with becoming or belonging. So, I want to sound the alarm to say that we should beware of street kid Christians. Yeah. A street kid lifestyle of Christians. In other words, we can call them rogue believers. <laughs> uh, because what happens with street kids, see, we do a bit of work with street kids. We have uh, uh, a place we call Kids of the Street. Uh, it's like a uh, shelter, yes, a shelter for street kids somewhere in Greater Lekki area. And in the last two years or so that we've piloted it, I've learned a bit of lessons from just watching how things evolve there. Street kids have certain characteristics. Put that slide back on the screen. They love to gain access to resources without responsibility. Wow. So when you're driving on the road and a street kid walks up to you, he wants to collect you know, something from you. Most of the time, if you have time, try to want to tell them what to do and what not to do. And you see how they walk away from you. Is it because I'm asking you for something? Yeah. <laughs> Is it because I'm asking you for something now? You're now trying to command me or to, you know. They are not used to accountability yeah. or any form of decorum. Yeah. yeah. I live in Lekki, and sometimes you're driving home at 11 you know, p.m. I'm going to you know, vigil in church, and I'll still see. And I'll, when I was growing up, by 8, you must have had your bath, get ready, you know, you finish your dinner. They'll say, you know, if I see you outside of your room. But you are seeing people on the street, kids on the street at 11 p.m. They are used to it. There are many believers today, that's how they want to live. Resources without responsibility. So we use God to get something, but are not responsible to anybody. Yeah. Competence without character. You know, the people today that will tell you, you know, they, 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 you know the reason why I'm talking about this is that the numbers seem to be increasing and we need to do something about it. And it's the church that can do something about it. The concept of believing without belonging is a thing. It's a body of knowledge now. Google it, you'll find it. It's called believing without belonging. 
It's a whole concept that is now being studied in institutions. Why people are choosing to believe without belonging. It's like saying, Jesus, I like you, but I don't like your children. I don't like your family. It's just you I like. <laughs> and so we're having many more people who don't want to belong to the family of God, but they want to believe and get the benefits. And the spirit of the age seems to be in alignment. Because things have changed around us. So competence without character, content without connection. I think it was Pastor Howard that was talking about, you know, people, YouTube and all that earlier today. Uh -huh. So there's access to content. You know, if today I have friends or people that I know, maybe not necessarily friends, but people that I know. I mean, I was on a tour of Europe like two weeks ago. I met people who would tell me that, oh, oh, I, I, know, I know your church. I like listening to you. In fact, you know, on Sundays, I have four pastors. <laughs> they tell you, you are one of them. Say, so I, I listen to Pastor Podju in the morning, uh, first service. Then I listen to you, and then uh, some, some of them will say, and then I now watch uh, Global Impact. And then and in the afternoon, when they wake up in America, I, I use uh, Tilly Jakes to shock it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so uh, in a Sunday, how they go to church is to have like five pastors that pray to them. They enjoy the content, but it's content without connection. But, but when you have content without connection, it is the making of, you know, rogue believers. <laughs> you know, uh, because people who just want to, uh, uh, they, they're not, they, we're not raising disciples that way. That's what I mean. Because when you read Acts chapter 2, the early church, the Bible says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. To be baptized means to be brought into a family, the family of God. They were baptized. Verse 41, they were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And fellowship. Can you see that? And fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayer. Then, said, fear came upon every soul and signs and wonders were drawn through the apostles. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they cared for one another. What I'm trying to say is that we need to posture not as a restaurant, not as hospital, we are all that, but much more than that, we are a family. Yeah. We are a family. We are a family. Because if you belong to a family, there will be food in your house. And that is your primary place of feeding. It doesn't mean that you won't eat out once in a while, but that's once in a while just to taste certain things that maybe they don't cook in your house. But if we check your formation, it is what is cooked in your house that should be, that should be coming out of you first. Lest you become like a street child. You know, street kids eat anything. Whatever is available, anything, you know, just take this, take that, take that, take that. Chinching, you know, popcorn, you know, just eat, eat anyhow. And that's how some people uh, seem to be going about this thing right now. Now, let me take this a little further uh, by just talking about what we have on ground right now. Uh, <laughs> the church must start to balance The power, wisdom, and character side of God. Because that's what actually creates a place that is very well suited for disciple making. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. It says, For the Jews 
request signs. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greek, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He said, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The church of Jesus must be a balanced church. The balance, you know, and the balance is right in the mix of the tripartite element of wisdom, power, and character. Very important. The reason why I'm bringing this up is that this mix is what creates a good balance. You know, I've said this, the church should be seen as a family. Yeah. Uh, it's a place to eat. It's a place to be healed. But it's not a restaurant only. It's a family. People have a lot of needs right now. Well, I mean, globally. So, people have need for healing. People have needs for financial breakthrough. They have all kinds of needs. They, they need to source the power of God. You see, in certain uh, uh, parts of life, power is the only solution. In certain, you know, <laughs> issues of destiny, it is power. In certain areas, it is wisdom. Yeah. Pastor God was showing us earlier that when it comes to protection, God has elevated direction more than power. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But the, 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 <laughs> when you look at that, you will now see somebody who says, the only thing I want to know about God is power. That means the person can miss direction. And when you focus on life like that, you're on your own. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. So when you look at it also, globally, <laughs> The charismatic Pentecostal church is known as a power church. The evangelical church is known as the wisdom church. Uh, I'm just saying that if we really want to raise balanced disciples, we must know that wisdom and power must come together. Because the Bible says here that Christ has been made unto us the wisdom of God and the power of God. Uh, we must not talk down on each other. Yeah, you know, to say, ah, in, in that church, they just teach, teach, teach. You won't even see demonstration. It's just teaching, 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 teaching. Everybody's writing down. Are they in the classroom? <laughs> you know, that's how some people talk. They say, uh, let power flow. <laughs> you know, in their own mind, is that if power is flowing, you don't need to write anything. Everything will be okay. <laughs> and so, inadvertently, we can disdain wisdom. In the same way, uh, we, we stand the risk of also disdaining power when we feel like, oh, you know, in this other place, this is what they do every time. And you know, when we were growing up in this country, I, I remember very well, in the early 90s, if you are invited for a, a conference like this, if you don't throw this jacket before you leave here, you are not a man of God. You know, because what used to happen then is you remove your jacket and I say, okay, you, everyone there, you, you need the power, you need the power, I throw it, you know. The... <laughs> and I, I'm not disdaining that. I hope you understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the balance of the two, because except they see signs, they will not believe. But in the becoming, they have to gain sense. Wisdom must enter into their heart to become and become like Christ. And then finally, we have to be a people of character so that they will stay. They know we have their best interests at heart. This is not a dog-eat-dog -dog environment. Yeah. They know that what we are saying is, I mean, one of the words about Gen Z, for instance, is authenticity. If you're a person of character, you will be authentic. Yeah. It's what you see is what you get. You don't have to package for Gen Z because they can see through you. And you know the Gen Z 
they can look at you from afar and know who you are. It's not discernment, though. It's just... <laughs> it's just who they are. <laughs> they just read you easily. <laughs> you know? So somebody goes to a church and says, you know, I'm not going back to that church next Sunday. They say, what? That pastor is fake. And that's what they say. So that pastor is not real. Yeah. You can read, you can see who is real. So, if we have the balance of it, we're building a strong church community, church family. People are not going to treat us like KFC or, you know, General Hospital. This is a family. But here, you'll be healed. Here, you'll be blessed. You will get wisdom here. You understand what I'm saying? We will demonstrate character to you here. You will know the values that undergird this family that you belong to. When uh, uh, this church was rebranded to be called Covenant Nation, I had to pray, God, should I change the name of our church to Elevation Nation? <laughs> because, no, you know what I'm saying that? It fits the mind frame that I've always had about church. Anybody that's been in our church for long will know that I say it all the time. The Elevation Church is not just a church you attend, it's a family you belong to. And a nation is more like a family. You understand what I'm saying? Uh -huh. It's just that I didn't, I didn't have the release to change it. I just have call pastor for that. Don't worry, I just, yeah, 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 my mentor, so I'm just following you. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, when, when you come into a place where you have an identity, a, a, an orientation, and everybody can key into that. That's what I'm talking about. Not just a, a, a free-flowing place where people don't even know why we're together. If you say, why, why do we exist? Some people say, eh, we, exist, we exist to make our pastor happy. You know, we, you know, we exist for this or that. Or we, Sometimes one outreach is what defines a church. Just one. So rather than saying, well, you know, this is about disciple making. This is about, you know, people who will carry the kingdom of God on their shoulders. People just say things, just identifying with one outreach of that church. And that's not really the reason why the church exists. Because everything we do at the end of the day must result into disciple making at the end of the day. Because that's our scorecard. That's our real scorecard. Everything must result back into disciple making. The picture the Holy Spirit gave me about this, you know, wisdom and power thing is one day I was meditating and the Holy Spirit was showing me that this wisdom and power thing is like riding a bicycle. He said, depending on the terrain where you are, sometimes you have to sway to the left or sway to the right, but you are creating the balance as you are going. Ladies and gentlemen, balance is not a static phenomenon. It's a dynamic phenomenon. How do I mean? You, you, you can't say, this is how I want to ride bicycle forever. You get to a terrain, you can be thrown off because you have to sway to the right or to the left, but, you are, but you, it's not a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. Uh, you, you get to situations where you have to pray and trust God. What is the key here? It's power. We're fighting something that requires raw power. We go for it. Here, it is wisdom. You have to think. When the the woman was caught in adultery. And they, they asked Jesus, this is what the Lord Moses said, what do you say that we do? You know what, I mean, Jesus, the wisdom of God had to come into manifestation there. He did not say, I'll just lay hands on all of you, fall under the anointing and you'll run away, you leave me. No, 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 no. It is the wisdom of God to think through and solve naughty problems and resolve issues. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, we saw the manifestation of God's wisdom there. The widows of, of the Greek-speaking believers were complaining against the Hebrew people because they were neglected in the distribution of food, the scripture says, and the, the apostles had to key into the wisdom of God to know that this is the time to get into the next layer of leadership, to get into delegation, you know, to refocus their priorities, but to solve that problem that threatened to split the early church. Many churches are, are, are going through splits today, not because God is not powerful, not because God wants the churches to be splitting. It's, it's you know, lack of free flow of divine wisdom sometimes because you can preempt 
something that can break the church into pieces. And it's about flowing in the wisdom of God as necessary. Glory be to God. Are you, are you getting blessed today? So it's very important that we give, I mean, that, that dynamic, let me give you a, 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 a quick example and I'll start to wrap up. You know, the dynamic expression of the wisdom of God for ministry, for instance, uh, in the areas like accountability, structure, and system. These are not uh, necessarily power-related stuff, but they are very powerful. Yeah. You know that structure cannot bring the power of God, but it can uh, maximize it. Yeah. It is in the place of prayer. The apostle said, we will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So that power will keep flowing. We'll keep enjoying divine presence. But the structures we are putting in place will now help us to maximize it too, so it can be efficient and we can get the right kind of result. Are you still with me today? Very, very important. So when you see things like that, you know, managing resources well, uh, uh, generational thinking, building capacity, capacity to scale, and stuff like that. These are expressions of the wisdom of God uh, for, for, for ministry relevance, you know, so that we can remain relevant in the things that God is doing. Let me uh, jump to the last bit of, uh, what, of the things that I have here. Uh, I, 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 I'll, uh, I'll be able to touch on it in the, you know, the last few minutes that I have, which is as we walk through this balance, we we'll then have to encounter the people that God has sent us to. And right from yesterday, it's been discussed consistently that the times are changing. The people, there are generations, new generations that we're dealing with. So, for instance, in the average workplace right now, just like in the average church, you have like three or four generations coexisting side by side. Especially here in this part of the world where people don't retire early. So you have baby boomers, people in their late 60s and all that, who are still running many things. And side by side with boomers, you have uh, the Gen X, like myself. You have millennials, and you have Gen Z. In the same office, just like you can have them in the same church. I mean, if it's church, you have it up to Alpha. In an office, maybe you won't have Alpha yet, except they are on internship. You understand? But when you have all this, and we're supposed to build a family that caters to all of them, and make sure that we're raising disciples, and the disciples that we're raising, they are growing and remaining. I mean, let me tell you the truth. What Pastor Ha and Pastor Leah have been describing to us, it takes the wisdom of God to pull it off. Yeah, and the power of God to pull it off. To get this mix all together with their different idiosyncrasies, and you know, and all that, I put a few there that you can see, and to be able to maneuver all that and raise a family for God where disciples are made consistently, not without, notwithstanding the idiosyncrasies of their generation. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And we have the tough challenge here in Africa, mainly also because outside of the church, there is already a cry for renewal. Like Pastor I was saying, we had a fair share of revolution in 2020 with the answers. Can you remember? Uh -huh. You know, Pastor, I was sharing this morning about renewal and revolution. One starts from bottom, one starts from top. And it's advising that we focus on renewal so that revolution will not come. When you put all this together, we have to focus on that renewal very well so that revolution will not come. Now, the mindset that under God's renewal is where I want to stop today. And this is how I want to put it. The mindset that under God's renewal is the tension between legacy and destiny. How do I mean? Legacy is where we are coming from, our heritage. 
Destiny is where we are going or what we are evolving into, who we are becoming. And there's always a tension between destiny and legacy. Destiny is where we are coming from, so we don't want to let go of it. I mean, le legacy is where we are coming from. We don't want to let go of it. But destiny is at stake if we over-romance legacy. Are you still with me today? Very, very important. So the church, though we are not going to shift from our identity, which is our legacy, but we have to pay attention to relevance. Some things are important and some things are not. If we're going to maneuver that space. So the church must not shift from this identity, which is a legacy, who we are, we are making disciples, but we will encounter Gen Z and Alpha who will seem to want us to make disciples on their own terms. How are we going to react? How are we going to behave? We have to be able to, you know, say to ourselves that some things are important and some things are not. It's uh, give and take. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In this day and age, there are still churches where, for instance, if you braid your hair, you can't lead worship as a guy. <laughs> Am I saying the truth? Yeah. Now, the Bible says food does not commend us to God. <laughs> and what he was saying is you have to choose what is important and what is not important. Let me give you a scriptural example of what I'm talking about. In Numbers 27, Moses had an issue. The daughters of Selophiad. I don't know if I have enough time. Three minutes. Numbers 27 from verse 1. Then came to the daughters of Selophiad, the son of Ephah, the son of Gilead, the son of uh, Makkah, the son of Manasseh, from the family of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and, you know, all that. Verse 2. And they stood before Moses, before Eleazar, the priest, and before the leaders and all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting, saying, our father died in the wilderness, but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord in the company with Korah. But he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. There are cases we have to bring before the Lord. It may not work with tradition. Yeah. We will bring it before the Lord. We will now hear God for now. Put the next verse there. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, look at, the daughters of Selophiad speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers and cause the inheritance of their fathers to pass to them. Moses sought the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, and Moses knew this is how to, and these daughters of Zerubbabel, their case is a special case. We cannot handle it traditionally that because they are women, they cannot get their inheritance. So we cannot say, for instance, that because you have tattoo, you cannot preach or because you have uh, you you wearing braid, you you cannot be a, a junior church teacher because you are wearing braid because you make all our children to wear braid. <laughs> you know those are kind of things that people say. So this is it, it's very important. So understanding change and continuity is crucial for ministry relevance. When you change what you should continue, identity is at stake. But when you continue what you should change, relevance is at stake. For us to remain relevant, we must know what to stop and what to continue. What to allow. Because Moses, if he didn't allow what he should allow, because of tradition, he 
may inadvertently be going against the will of God for that situation. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And the daughters of Silophia will be so disenfranchised and they will go into resignation like Pastor Howe taught us earlier. And, and that's how, you know, we just see a move of God fizzling out. Are you still with me today? So all I'm saying is that God wants his church to remain relevant. And to be relevant, we must know what are the issues of identity and what are the issues of relevance. Yeah. So that we don't lose our influence. As we walk with different generations, there are things that we must hold dear to our heart. This is who we are as the church. We are a church of power, a church of wisdom, and a church of character. We are not going to bend our character because of a generation, but we are going to allow the generation to express themselves in a way that does that do not alter the identity of the church, but gives them meaning and relevance for their own generation. My yeah. time is up, and I just want us to maybe just say a prayer. Just, you just, I don't know really what you want to pray about, <laughs> but there's something to pray about. Uh, somebody here needs to say, Lord, open my eyes to this real scorecard of our ministry. Yeah. Help me to see how we're supposed to be moving people. Help me to see what we need to jettison and what we need to continue. Help me to see what we need to open up to. Maybe you should just say that prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And we ask that you cause this word to bear fruit in every ministry that is here. Lord, open our eyes to know and see the things that we should make a fuss about and the things we should let go. Help us to understand our scorecard in heaven. Thank you, everlasting Father, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Kwaji. God bless you, sir.